Hey, what's this dust coming? When Robbie the robot stepped out of that Jeep and walked up to those guys, and I said, this is it. For your convenience, I am monitored to respond to the name Robbie. We really believed that this was a robot that was like a character, like a real person. Can I be of service, sir? And what is it you require this time, Miss Alpha? Nobody had ever seen anything like Robbie, period. And he just clicked with a generation. You can't think of Forbidden Planet without thinking of Robbie the Robot. Monster Carrying the Girl has always been a classic from the days of Gorilla Pictures. It was a little duplicitous and that Robbie looked menacing. We saw that poster of Robbie carrying Anne Francis around, and the inference is that the robot is going to do something bad. Not only does it not take place in the film, it completely changes the character of Robbie, who is a servant of humankind and wouldn't harm a fly. Welcome to Altair 4, gentlemen. Robbie was your guardian and your protector. And so he was an enduring character. Robbie was very complicated looking and very smart looking. I'm sure he was the only one in the universe that looked like Robbie. I am monitored to admit no one at this hour. It had this very authoritative voice that uh, reassured you that uh, you know, Robbie was in control. He was able to take commands. He was able to process food. He was able to make whiskey for the cook after tasting it. Too. What's great about Robbie is he's very 1950s, and Robbie was what we thought the future should look like, so they built him that way. Robbie the robot was designed really not by any one artist. Irving Block did drawings, and so did Buddy Gillespie, and the various departments were all uh, contributing. And then Bob Kinoshita sort of took all of those ideas and melded it into one basic idea. I was a design draftsman at the time in MGM. We had five guys designing, and we just knocked out, must have been out about a couple of thousand drawings by the time five weeks goes by. <laughs> so I said, the hell with this, I'm gonna make me a model. So I stopped making a model, it was about that big. After I almost got through, the art director, Art Lonigan, came by, he says, hey, give me that thing, so he grabs it, he runs, and he really ran right through the drafting room, went into the uh, uh, producer's office. Ten minutes later, he comes running back, and he said, you draw it up. <laughs> and that's how Robbie the Robot was born. Ladies and gentlemen, the robot of the Forbidden Planet. Now, these are his eyes. These, his ears, tuned in all directions to receive the slightest sound. And... This is his brain. Robbie was a great design. I mean, he was anthropomorphic. He had a head, shoulders, feet, arms, and you knew where to look to see him express himself. Robbie's head looks like one big vacuum tube, and the rest of his body actually looks like a washing machine tub because that's what Mr. Kinoshita used to design. He was into designing washing machines out of clear plastic so they can see the agitators go and these the bizarre mechanisms, and a lot of his design experience came over into the design of Robbie. The thing was how to use plastics in a new way, and that's how, how, what we tried to do. See? Nobody actually had shaped plastics in those kind of ways, and new technology was created for Robbie. So Robbie the Robot actually did push science forward. Nice climate you have here. High oxygen content. I rarely use it myself, sir. It promotes rust. Robbie was actually built in the leather shop at MGM because the leather workers, the guys who formed holsters and stuff, had more idea of how to form things than the construction department. Finally, they settled on a material called Royalite, which was actually what they used to make suitcases out of in the 1950s. If you saw the inside of Robbie, it looks like the suitcase. It's got like sort of the alligator texture or something on the inside. They wanted a man inside, which makes it awful hard to design robots. But uh, I tried to uh, eliminate the appearance of a uh, man being in there. I tried to make a guess, where is this guy, you know, inside that suit? 
<laughs> well, MGM at the time sold Robbie as that he was absolutely a real robot. And I grew up till I was a teenager thinking that somehow they had managed to pull this off. Later we found out that Robbie had uh, a guy inside, you know, it was, it, was, it was akin to finding out there was no Santa Claus. Uh, and not that I'm saying that there is no Santa Claus. <laughs> You have to be a certain build to get inside Robbie. Short in stature, long legs, short upper torso, because you don't want your head getting into all the whirly gadgets. You can't see. You're really the man is looking from behind the neon tubes. He had a black in his face, <laughs> and you always looked kind of funny. Looked like a big mask on him. <laughs> he went to lunch that way. <laughs> it was hard work. That was a heavy thing. You wouldn't walk too far. One day, the young man who was going to be working that afternoon, he got inside the suit and he started going down this little plank and everyone realized at once he didn't have a good grip on it. <laughs> and then about 15 grips <laughs> ran in and caught him just before he hit the floor with a splat. They didn't have another Robbie, there was only one and if had he fallen over it would have set production back quite a lot. He was very expensive at the time. The price that was quoted was $100,000 in 1955 when he was built. The way actors were second to Robbie, he was really the star of the picture. Is it a male or female? In my case, sir, the question is totally without meaning. The voice was portrayed by actor and announcer Marvin Miller, who was a radio man for years and then was in the Millionaire series. But he had this voice. Morbius. What? Something is approaching from the southwest. It is now quite close. That gave Robbie the robot the sophistication of a human being, which was what made him a viable companion. Well, this is the original Robbie the robot from Forbidden Planet. Down here is his analyzing box that uh, you remember Earl Holloman pours the, uh, the the booze into, which is in this little flap up here, which I'll open up for you. These little buttons here that move when they're on have a really interesting effect because it almost looks like LCDs moving, and, and you really can't in the film tell what they are, but on close inspection, you can see all it is is just catches the light. I think it's a really kind of a brilliant idea. The head turns on uh, a set of bearings which were uh, Custom made. A lot of the stuff in Robbie was actually aircraft stuff. Lockheed Aircraft used to be very angry with MGM because they'd go in and MGM would buy up all their best machinists that come in and, and raid their machinists and get the best guys there. And Robbie's an example of all that. I mean, he's just very well made and everything moves very, very smoothly. But it was all built actually custom, so there isn't anything on here that's store bought. Up here are the neon tubes, which operated when he talked. The way this was originally accomplished was uh, they had a large box, which was an amplifier that drove these, and they actually ran a cable up the heel, which ran about 7,000 volts, uh, which made the neons work. Normally, the mouth was operated by a uh, voice-actuated circuit off camera. But when the actor would speak, the uh, mouth would light up like so. I'm doing it, actually, I'm cheating. I have a little button. I'm talking rather loud, as you can tell, because I have to talk over Robbie's mechanism. And this is pretty much the sound he made when they were shooting Forbidden Planet. Every time Robbie is in the scene, there's just a tremendous racket going on. And any scene that Robbie was in, they had to ADR it, which means to replace the dialogue uh, because he was, was so noisy. Because Robbie was so expensive and sort of high technology at the time, they only ever built one. And there, are, as you probably are aware of, there's people building replicas. I remember I, back in high school, I was building my first Robbie. I was 16 years old. And everybody else was working on cars or going on dates. And I would walk down the hallway and a guy would say, hey, there's Fred Barton, the robot man. And that name has stuck, you know, 30 years now. And I'm still the robot man. This particular Robbie is a very popular model. It's the collector's edition. You notice he's much quieter than the fully mechanized robot. You don't have to scream over him. And a lot of people want this for their office. And he'll go into automatic mode in a couple of minutes here. And he'll start uh, turning his head and lighting and his scanners will come on. But it's all microprocessor controlled. It's whatever the robot wants to do. See, there he goes. Don't, don't look at me. And of course, everything is molded right off the original robot, so it's not a re-sculpt. This is, this is the real deal. Robbie the Robot became a favorite of every young kid. 
It was one of my favorites. When the film was over, the talk at school for the next months was, can't we have Robbie the Robot around? Because he was strong, and if you had a bully push you around, Robbie could save you. I think every kid in America would love to have been Cookie. You know, who wouldn't want to have their own robot? Kids watching Robbie get very inspired. I see a lot of wonderful students who come in and say, you know, I want to work on these robots. Then they want to create that R2-D2, Robbie, C-3PO, and then they learn why it isn't possible quite today and how can they get us closer. At USC in particular, we're focusing on what we call human-centered robotics. So it's robotics for helping people, whether it be the elderly or special education, search and rescue, emergency response. You can do specific things. But if you want a general robot that's going to, say, run around your house, keep the place clean, monitor for intruders, that's really hard. And so that's what we're working towards. And in many ways, you know, that's what Robbie was. If you gentlemen will go in, you're expected. Robbie was the first very sophisticated automaton. I mean, the way he talked and walked and, and acted. Robbie was a real person. I will run the dress up for you in time for breakfast. And he went on for the next 50 years, like any other character actor, doing guest shots in TV and film. It's probably the first case of a completely non-human actor gaining that kind of popularity to the point to where it could spawn a sequel on its own. He was so popular, he went on to do another movie. The Invisible Boy. Come on, Robbie. Yes, master. In fact, they reissued Forbidden Planet some years later, MGM did, for Kitty Matinees, and they cut out <laughs> all of the love stuff <laughs> and just concentrated on the spectacle and Robbie the Robot. Come on! Did you see that? Robbie was in the Thin Man episode with Phyllis Kirk and Peter Lawford, and then, you know, it showed up on Lost in Space on two or three episodes. In fact, is often confused with the Lost in Space robot because Bob Kenosha later designed the robot for Lost in Space. Robbie was my, in, in my first picture, Hollywood Boulevard. Then I used him in Gremlins, and I used him again in Looney Tunes Back in Action. There was a big scene where a lot of 50s monsters and I just couldn't do it without Robbie. went over to uh, Pittsburgh to get Robbie into the Robot Hall of Fame. I was surprised how uh, famous he was. Robbie was designed in 56, and uh, here it's, uh, what, 50 years ago. The unbelievable popularity over the past 50 years with Robbie the Robot is really is just his look. His whole stance is something indescribable. It's timeless, yet it's still locked in time. There's nothing like it today. It's just really cool, you think so? That is correct, sir.